a traditional American wedding. Many young couples consider their wedding to be one of the most important days of their life. They save for it and often spend a year planning for it, finding a place, selecting a menu and cake, buying a wedding dress, ordering invitations and sending them to friends and relatives, selecting musicians and much more. The bride chooses her maid of honor and bridesmaids, and the groom chooses his best man and groomsman. The bride and groom want to make this day special for themselves and for their guests. When the day arrives, the groom doesn't usually see the bride before the wedding. It is considered bad luck for him to see her ahead of time. The guests wait with excitement to see her too. When the wedding begins, the groom and groomsmen enter first. Then the bridesmaids enter. When the bride finally enters in her white dress, everyone turns around to look at her. Sometimes guests stand up when the bride enters. Often the bride's father or both of her parents walk her down the aisle to the groom's side. During the ceremony, the bride and groom take vows. They promise to love and respect each other for the rest of their lives. The groom's best man holds the rings for them until they are ready to place them on each other's fingers. At the end of the ceremony, the groom lifts the bride's veil and kisses her. There is a party after the ceremony. People make toasts, eat dinner, and dance. The bride and groom usually dance the first dance alone. Then guests join them. Before the bride and groom leave the party, the bride throws her bouquet over her head, and the single women try to catch it. It is believed that the woman who catches it will be the next one to get married. The newlyweds usually take a trip, called a honeymoon, immediately after the wedding. Economizing on a Wedding The average cost of a wedding in the U.S. today is $28,800. In days past, the bride's parents usually paid for the wedding. But as today's brides and grooms are older when they get married, they often pay for things themselves. There are many couples who put themselves in debt to create a dream wedding. Some recently married people gave advice on how to economize on a wedding and still have a lovely, memorable event. Here are their tips. I always pictured myself in a beautiful white dress, but when I went shopping and saw that most dresses are at least $1,000, I decided to look for a second-hand dress. I found something for $200, and it was lovely. When my sister got married, she made her dress herself and spent only $100 on fabric and lace. It isn't necessary to spend so much money on a dress. A bride is always beautiful. We were going to use a professional printer for the invitations, but we decided to make the invitations ourselves. We designed them on the computer and added ribbons. The guests told us that they were beautiful and original. I always wanted live music at my wedding, but when I saw the cost of musicians, I was shocked. My cousin plays piano well, so I asked her to play the piano for the wedding, and we used a DJ for the dancing afterwards. We had to remind ourselves that the music wasn't the focus for the day. Our marriage was. Most couples want to get married in the summer. Ask yourself how important a summer wedding really is. You can cut costs by having a wedding at a less popular time. For example, a wedding in January is cheaper than a wedding in August. According to some couples, it is not good to economize on some things. Don't try to save money by sending invitations or thank you cards through email. Guests are offended. You should use postal mail. We asked a friend to take pictures at our wedding, but were very disappointed with the results. Our advice? Hire a professional photographer. You want to look at yourselves and guests for years to come. The best way to economize is to cut the guest list and invite only your closest relatives and friends. Although most young couples want a perfect wedding, the most important thing is to have a good marriage. One. Time travel. If you could travel to the past or the future, would you do it? If you could travel to the past, would you want to visit anyone? If you could travel to the future, would you come back to the present and warn people about possible disasters? Time travel, first presented in a novel called The Time Machine, written by H.G. Wells over 100 years ago, is the subject not only of fantasy, 
but of serious scientific exploration. About 100 years ago, Albert Einstein proved that the universe has not three dimensions, but four. Three of space and one of time. He proved that time changes with motion. Einstein believed that, theoretically, time travel is possible. The time on a clock in motion moves more slowly than the time on a stationary clock. If you wanted to visit the Earth in the future, you would have to get on a rocket ship going at almost the speed of light, travel many light years away, turn around, and come back at that speed. While traveling, you would age more slowly. Einstein came up with an example he called the twin paradox. Suppose there is a set of 25-year-old twins, Nick and Rick. If Nick decided to travel fast and far on a rocket ship, and Rick decided to stay at home, Nick would be younger than Rick when he returned. Specifically, if Nick traveled 25 light years away and back, the trip would take 50 Earth years. Rick would be 75 years old, but Nick would be 25 and a half years old. If Nick had a five-year-old daughter when he left, his daughter would be 55 years old, so Nick would be visiting the future. Using today's technologies, time travel is still impossible. If you wanted to travel to the nearest star, which is 4.3 light years away, it would take 80,000 years to arrive. This assumes the speed of today's rockets, which is 37,000 miles per hour. According to Einstein, you can't travel faster than the speed of light. While most physicists believe the travel to the future is possible, it is believed the travel to the past will never happen. Although the idea of time travel seems the subject of science fiction, not science, many of today's discoveries and explorations, such as traveling to the moon, had their roots in science fiction novels and movies. Reading 2 Exploring Mars Mars, our closest planetary neighbor, has always fascinated people on Earth. If you watch a lot of science fiction movies, you see people from Earth meeting strange-looking Martians. But of course, this is just fantasy. In 2004, Spirit Rover landed on Mars to study the climate and geology of the planet and to prepare for human exploration. In 2012, Curiosity Rover landed on Mars. Its mission is to find out if there was ever life on that planet. One of the jobs of Curiosity is to figure out where a future mission should look for life. If enough information is gathered, astronauts will probably arrive on Mars by the 2030s. Travel to Mars will be much more difficult than landing on the moon. When people landed on the moon, they carried with them all the supplies they needed. But sending a spaceship with people and all the supplies they need for their time on Mars would make the spaceship too heavy. So if astronauts go to Mars, scientists will send supplies first. Many other problems will have to be solved, too. Astronauts will have to return within a given time period. If they don't come back within this period of time, they will miss their chance of return. If astronauts have a problem with their equipment, they will not be able to rely on messages from Earth to help them. Because of the distance from Earth, it can take about 40 minutes from the time a message goes out from Earth until it is received on Mars. Also, a visitor to Mars will be gone for at least three years because of the distance and time necessary to travel. But one of the biggest problems with traveling to Mars is the danger of radiation. Astronauts will be exposed to much more radiation than someone traveling to the moon. If you had the chance to go to Mars, would you go? Reading 3 Life 100 Years Ago Most of us are amazed by the rapid pace of technology at the beginning of the 21st century. We often wonder what life will be like 20 or 50 or 100 years from now. But do you ever wonder what your life would have been like if you had been alive 100 years ago? 
If you had lived around 1900 in the United States, you probably wouldn't have graduated from high school. Only 6% of Americans had a high school diploma at that time. If you had been a child living in a city, you might have had to work in a factory for 12 to 16 hours a day, six days a week. In 1900, 6% of American workers were between the ages of 10 and 15. If you had worked at a manufacturing job, you would have had to work about 53 hours a week, and you would have earned about 20 cents an hour. This is equivalent to about $5 an hour today. Many of you would have worked on farms. 38% of laborers were farm workers. If you had been a woman in 1900, you probably wouldn't have been part of the labor force. Only 19% of women worked outside the home. If you had gone to a doctor, he probably would not have had a college education, and he wouldn't have had practical training before becoming a doctor. At that time, medical students learned only from textbooks. If you had had a baby in 1900, it would have been born at home. If you had gotten an infection at that time, you might have died because antibiotics had not yet been discovered. The leading causes of death at that time were pneumonia, influenza, and tuberculosis. What about your home? If you had been living 100 years ago, you probably wouldn't have had a bathtub or a telephone or electricity. You would have been living with a large number of people. 20% of homes had seven or more people. Do you think you would have been happy with life 100 years ago? Finding a job Finding a job in the United States takes specific skills. The following advice will help you find a job. Write a good resume. Describe your accomplishments. Avoid including unnecessary information. Your resume should be one page if possible. Find out about available jobs. One way is by looking in the newspaper or on the internet. Another way is by networking. Networking means exchanging information with anyone you know, family, friends, neighbors, classmates, former co-workers, professional groups, who might know of a job. These people might also be able to give you insider information about a company, such as who is in charge and what it is like to work at their company. According to an article in the Wall Street Journal, 94% of people who succeed in finding a job say that networking was a big help. Practice the interview. The more prepared you are, the more relaxed you will feel. If you are worried about saying or doing the wrong thing, practice will help. Learn something about the company. You can find information by going to the company's website. Getting information takes time, but it pays off. You can get help in these skills, writing a resume, networking, preparing for an interview, researching a company, by seeing a career counselor. Most high schools and colleges have one who can help you get started. Finding a job is one of the most difficult jobs. Some people send out hundreds of resumes and go on dozens of interviews before finding a job. And it isn't something you do just once or twice in your lifetime. For most Americans, changing jobs many times in a lifetime is not uncommon. Tips on writing a resume It's important to write a good, clear resume. A resume should be limited to one page. It is only necessary to describe your most relevant work. Employers are busy people. Don't expect them to read long resumes. You need to present your abilities in your resume. Employers expect you to use action verbs to describe your experience. Don't begin your sentences with I. Use past tense verbs like managed, designed, created, and developed. It is not enough to say you improved something. Be specific. How did you improve it? Before making copies of your resume, it is important to check the grammar and spelling. Employers want to see if you have good communication skills. Ask a friend or teacher to read and give an opinion about your resume. It isn't necessary to include references. 
If the employer wants you to provide references, he or she will ask you to do so during or after the interview. Don't include personal information such as marital status, age, race, family information, or hobbies. Be honest in your resume. Employers can check your information. No one wants to hire a liar. Reading 1 Andrew Carnegie, Philanthropist. Andrew Carnegie was one of the world's richest men. He made a fortune in the oil and steel industries. Did he enjoy his wealth? Of course he did. But there is something he enjoyed even more, giving away his money. Carnegie was born in Scotland in 1835 to a very poor family. When his father lost his job, his mother started to work to support the family. When Andrew was 13 years old, his mother persuaded his father to leave Scotland for the possibilities of America. A year later, Andrew started to work in a factory in Pittsburgh. He met a man who let him and other working boys use his small library. Andrew was eager to read and learn as much as he could. He was intelligent and hardworking, and it didn't take him long to become rich. As Carnegie's fortunes grew, he started to give his money away. One of his biggest desires was to build free public libraries. He wanted everyone to have access to libraries and education. He believed that education was the key to a successful life. In 1881, there were only a few public libraries. Carnegie started to build free libraries so that everyone would have access to knowledge. Over the doors of the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, carved in stone, are the words, Free to the People. By the time Carnegie died in 1919, there were more than 2,500 public libraries in the English-speaking world. But building libraries was not his only contribution. In his book, The Gospel of Wealth, he tried to persuade other wealthy people to give away their money. These are some of the ideas he wrote about in his book. To give away money is the best thing rich people can do. It is the moral obligation of the wealthy to help others. It is important for a rich person to set an example for others. It is not good to have money if your spirit is poor. It is a disgrace to die rich. By the time he died, Carnegie had given away more than $350 million. Reading 2. Helping Others Get an Education When we think of philanthropists, we usually think of the very rich and famous, like Andrew Carnegie or Bill Gates. However, Mattel Dawson, a forklift driver in Michigan, was an ordinary man who did extraordinary things. Dawson started working at Ford Motor Company in 1940 for $1.15 an hour. By working hard, saving carefully, and investing his money wisely, he became rich. But he didn't care about owning expensive cars or taking fancy vacations. Instead of spending his money on himself, he enjoyed giving it away. During his lifetime, he donated more than $1 million for college scholarships to help students get an education. Why did Dawson insist on giving his money away to students? One reason was that he did not have the opportunity to finish school. He had to drop out of school after the seventh grade to help support his poor family. He knew that not having an education limits job possibilities. Also, he learned about giving from his parents. He watched them work hard, save their money, and help others less fortunate. His mother made Dawson promise to always give something back. He was grateful to his parents for teaching him the importance of helping others. When he became rich, he didn't change his lifestyle. He continued driving his old car and living in a one-bedroom apartment. And he didn't stop working until shortly before he died at the age of 81. When asked why he worked long past the time when most people retire, he replied, It keeps me going knowing I'm helping somebody. Ellis Island 
For many years, Ellis Island, an island in New York Harbor, was the main door through which millions of immigrants entered the United States. From the time it opened in 1892 until the time it closed in 1924, the U.S. Bureau of Immigration used Ellis Island to receive and process new arrivals. During this time, 12 million foreigners passed through this door with the hope of becoming Americans. They came from Italy, Poland, Russia, Germany, China, and many other countries. Sometimes more than 10,000 people passed through the registry room in one 24-hour period. New arrivals often waited for many hours while inspectors checked to see if they met legal and medical standards. Most did not speak English, and they were tired, hungry, and confused. 2%, 250,000 people, did not meet the requirements to enter the U.S. and had to return to their countries. After Congress passed an immigration law that limited the number and nationality of new immigrants, immigration slowed down, and Ellis Island was closed as an immigration processing center. It remained abandoned until 1965, when President Lyndon Johnson decided to restore it as a monument. Restoration of Ellis Island was finished by 1990. Now visitors to this monument can see the building as it looked from 1918 to 1920. In addition, they can see the Wall of Honor with the names of many of those who passed through on their way to becoming American citizens. Albert Einstein, Refugee from Germany Of the many refugees who came to the U.S., one will always be remembered throughout the world, Albert Einstein. Einstein changed our understanding of the universe. Einstein was born in Germany in 1879 to Jewish parents. When he graduated from college in Switzerland in 1900, he was planning to become a teacher of physics and math, but could not find a job in those fields. Instead, he went to work in a patent office as a technical expert from 1902 to 1909. While he was working at this job, he studied and wrote in his spare time. In 1905, when he was only 26 years old, he published three papers that explained the basic structure of the universe. His theory of relativity explained the relationship of space and time. He returned to Germany to accept a research position at the University of Berlin. However, in 1920, while he was lecturing at the university, anti-Jewish groups often interrupted his lectures, saying they were un-German. In 1920, Einstein visited the United States for the first time. During his visits, he talked not only about his scientific theories, but also about world peace. While he was visiting the U.S. again in 1933, the Nazis came to power in Germany. They took his property, burned his books, and removed him from his university job. In 1933, Einstein helped establish the International Rescue Committee to assist anti-Nazi opponents of Hitler. The U.S. offered Einstein refugee status, and in 1940, he became a U.S. citizen. He received many job offers from all over the world, but he decided to accept a position at Princeton University in New Jersey. He lived and worked there until he died in 1955. Reading 1. Oscar Knight in Hollywood The movie stars are arriving to walk the red carpet to the Dolby Theater. As they are getting out of their limousines, they are being photographed from every angle. The women are being interviewed about their choice of gowns, and they are always told how beautiful they look. People at home are starting to gather around their TVs to see their favorite stars. It's Oscar night in Hollywood. The Dolby Theater will fill up with more than 3,000 people from the movie industry and their guests. If you have seen this show, you know that these awards also known as the Academy Awards, are given out each year in February or March. A few months before the show, the nominees are announced. Movie critics often make predictions about who will win in each category. The awards are presented in 24 categories, Best Foreign Film, 
Best Actor, Best Music, and Best Costume, to name a few. But the audience is not given the results quickly. In fact, the show often lasts more than two hours, with suspense building until the last winner is announced, the best picture of the year. This is how it is done today. But when the award ceremony started in 1929, only 15 awards were presented, and the ceremony was attended by only 250 people. Tickets cost $10, about $139 in today's dollars, and anyone who could afford a ticket could attend. Until 1941, the winners' names were already known before the ceremony and published in newspapers the night before, so there was not much suspense. But when television was invented and came into more and more people's homes, Oscar night started to become the spectacular show that it is today. Since 1953, Oscar night has been televised and broadcast all over the world. This show is seen by millions of people. Reading 2 Charlie Chaplin You have seen many movies and animations with the most advanced technology. And you can probably recognize many of today's popular actresses and actors. But have you ever heard of Charlie Chaplin? Charlie Chaplin was one of the greatest actors in the world. During the time of silent movies, Chaplin was the highest paid person in the world, not just the highest paid actor. His amusing character, the little tramp, with his worn-out shoes, round hat, and cane, is still well known to people throughout the world. Chaplin had an amazing life. His idea for this poor tramp probably came from his childhood experiences. Born in poverty in London in 1889, Chaplin was abandoned by his father and left in an orphanage by his sick mother. He became interested in acting at the age of five. At ten, he left school to travel with a British acting company. In 1910, he made his first trip to the United States. He was talented, athletic, and hardworking. On his second trip to the United States, in 1912, his talent was recognized and he was offered a movie contract. In 1917, when his contract expired, he built his own studio, where he produced, directed, and wrote the movies he starred in. He even composed the music that was played with his movies. Five years after arriving in the United States, he was earning $10,000 a week. Even though sound was introduced in movies in 1927, Chaplin continued to make silent movies. He didn't make a movie with sound until 1940, when he played a comic version of the terrifying dictator Adolf Hitler. As Chaplin got older, he faced declining popularity as a result of his politics and personal relationships. After he left the United States in 1952, Chaplin was not allowed to re-enter because of his political views. He didn't return to the United States until 1972, when he was given a special Oscar for his lifetime of outstanding work. Google Since its start in 1998, Google has become one of the most popular search engines. It has grown from a research project in the dormitory room of two college students to a business that now employs approximately 20,000 people. Google's founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, met in 1995 when they were in their 20s and graduate students in computer science at Stanford University in California. They realized that Internet search was a very important field and began working together to make searching easier. Both Page and Brin left their studies at Stanford to work on their project. Interestingly, they have never returned to finish their degrees. Brin was born in Russia, but he has lived in the U.S. since he was five years old. His father was a mathematician in Russia. Page whose parents were computer experts, has been interested in computers since he was six years old. When Google started in 1998, it did 10,000 searches a day. 
Today, it does 235 million searches a day in 40 languages. It indexes 1 trillion web pages. How is Google different from other search engines? Have you ever noticed how many ads and banners there are on other search engines? News, sports scores, stock prices, links for shopping, mortgage rates, and more fill other search engines. Bryn and Page wanted a clean homepage. They believed that people come to the Internet to search for specific information, not to be hit with a lot of unwanted data. The success of Google over its rivals has proved that this is true. Over the years, Google has added new features to its website, Google Images, where you can type in a word and get thousands of pictures, Google News, which takes you to today's news, Google Maps, and more. But one thing hasn't changed, the clean opening page that Google offers its users. In 2009, Forbes.com listed Page and Brin as having net worths of $12 billion each at 36 and 35 years old. Pierre Omidyar and eBay Did you ever want to sell a birthday present that you didn't like? Or an old toy that is taking up space in your closet? In the old days, buyers and sellers were limited to newspapers, garage sales, and flea markets in the area where they lived. But in the early 1990s, when people started to use the Internet, Pierre Omidyar had an idea. Omidyar, who was working as a computer programmer, realized that sellers no longer had to be limited to finding buyers who lived in their local area. He came up with the idea of eBay, which he started as a hobby. He didn't charge money at first because he wasn't sure eBay would work. Buying online requires you to trust sellers whom you've never met. But people liked eBay. Soon there was so much activity on eBay that his internet service provider upgraded his site to a business account, which was no longer free. So Omidyar started to charge the sellers a small fee for each sale. Before long, this hobby grew into a big business. By 1998, eBay had become so big that Omidyar needed a business expert. He brought in Meg Whitman, whose knowledge of business helped make eBay a success. She changed eBay from a company that sold used things in several categories to a large marketplace of 78 million items, both new and used, in 50,000 categories. Many companies that start out well on the internet later fail. When Whitman left the company, it started to decline. In 2008, John Donahue was brought in as the new CEO. He fired many people who had been working there for years. He understood that smartphones and tablets were changing the way that people shopped. People no longer had to shop from their home computers. He created an eBay app so that people could shop 24-7 and could pay with one click eBay, which was about to follow other internet businesses into decline, was brought back to life. By the time Omidyar was 31, he was worth more than $7 billion. The money that he has earned is much more than he needs. He and his wife signed a promise, the Giving Pledge, to give away the majority of their wealth during their lifetime to help others. Reading 1 Travel by Land, The Lewis and Clark Expedition Imagine a time when most people in the eastern part of the United States had no idea what was on the other side of the Mississippi River. That was the case at the beginning of the 19th century, when Thomas Jefferson was the third president of the United States. The nation was only 18 years old then and had about 5 million people. They were living between the Atlantic Ocean and the Mississippi River. President Jefferson wanted control over the Indian tribes who were living throughout the continent. In addition, he wanted to find a land passage to the Pacific Ocean. He was hoping to create a country that went from sea to sea. Meriwether Lewis was working as an aide to the president. 
Jefferson appointed Lewis and his friend William Clark to lead a dangerous 33-man expedition to the northwest through rivers and over the Rocky Mountains. The expedition left St. Louis in May 1804. As the men were going down the Missouri River, Clark stayed on the boat and drew maps and planned the course. Lewis often stayed on land to study animals and plants. While they were crossing the continent, they met some Indian tribes who were helpful, but they also met some who were hostile. By the time the expedition reached North Dakota, winter was fast approaching. They needed to wait until spring to cross the Rocky Mountains. As they were waiting out the winter, they met a Shoshone woman, Sacagawea, and her Canadian husband. With their help, the expedition started the most dangerous part of the journey crossing the Rocky Mountains. They were going to need horses. Sacagawea helped them get horses from her tribe. While they were traveling, they faced many hardships, hunger, danger from bears, bad weather, and uncertainty about their future. Several times while they were sleeping, their horses were stolen. They had no communication with anyone back east. No one even knew if they were still alive. In November 1805, tired but successful, they finally made it to the Pacific. When they returned to St. Louis almost two and a half years later, the people of St. Louis were waiting to greet them. They were heroes. Reading 2 Travel by Sea The First and Last Voyage of the Titanic the year was 1912. The railroad across the United States had already been built. The Wright brothers had already made their first successful flight. Henry Ford had already produced his first car. The Titanic, the ship of dreams, had just been built and was ready to make its first voyage from England to America with over 2,000 people aboard. The Titanic was the most magnificent ship that had ever been built. It had luxuries that ships had never had before. Electric light, elevators, a swimming pool, libraries, and more. It was built to give its first-class passengers all the comforts of the best hotels. Some of the wealthiest people in the world were on the Titanic. But not everyone on the Titanic was rich. Most of the passengers in third class were emigrants who had left behind a complete way of life and were going to America with hopes of a better future. The Titanic began its voyage on April 10th. The previous winter had been unusually mild, and by spring, large blocks of ice had broken away from the Arctic region. The captain had been receiving warnings about ice, but he was not very worried. He did not realize how much danger the ship was in. On April 14th, at 11.40 p.m., an iceberg was spotted right ahead. The captain tried to reverse the direction of his ship, but he couldn't because it had been traveling too fast. It hit the iceberg and started to sink. The Titanic had originally had 32 lifeboats, but 12 of them had been removed before sailing to make the ship look more elegant. There were only enough lifeboats for about half of the people aboard. While the ship was sinking, passengers were being put on lifeboats, women and children before men. First-class passengers boarded the lifeboats before second- and third-class passengers. By the time the third-class passengers came up from their cabins, most of the lifeboats had already left, some of them half-empty. Within two hours and 45 minutes, the ship had gone completely down. Cold and afraid, people in the lifeboats had been waiting all night, not knowing if they would be saved or if their loved ones were dead or alive. In the early morning, the Carpathia, a ship that responded to the Titanic's call for help, arrived to rescue the survivors. Only one-third of the passengers survived. An apartment lease When people rent an apartment, they often have to sign a lease. A lease is an agreement between the owner, landlord, and the renter, tenant. A lease states the period of time for the rental, the amount of the rent, and the rules the renter must follow. 
Some leases contain the following rules. Renters must not have a waterbed. Renters must not have a pet. Renters must not change the locks without the owner's permission. Renters must pay a security deposit. Many owners ask the renters to pay a security deposit in case there are damages. When the renters move out, the owners are supposed to return the deposit plus interest if the apartment is in good condition. If there is damage, the owners can use part or all of the money to repair the damage. However, they may not keep the renters' money for normal wear and tear, the normal use of the apartment. Renters do not have to agree to all the terms of the lease. They can ask for changes before they sign. A pet owner, for example, can ask for permission to have a pet by offering to pay a higher security deposit. There are laws that protect renters. For example, owners must provide heat during the winter months. In most cities, they must put a smoke detector in each apartment and in the halls. In addition, owners can't refuse to rent to a person because of sex, race, religion, nationality, or disability. When the lease is up for renewal, owners can offer the renters a new lease or they can ask the renters to leave. The owners are supposed to notify the renters, usually at least 30 days in advance, if they want the renters to leave. Americans and where they live. There are over 300 million people in the United States. The average family has 3.19 people. 6% of children live in households run by one or both grandparents. 68% of children live with two parents. 16% of males, 25 to 34, live at home with one or both parents. 9% of females, 25 to 34, live at home with one or both parents. 27% of Americans live alone. Compare this figure to the percentage in 1940, 8%. 39% of households have a dog. 31% of households have a cat. Homes. 67% of American families own their homes. 25% of homeowners are over 65 years old. The price of homes depends on the city where you live. Some cities, such as San Francisco, Boston, San Diego, Honolulu, and New York, have very expensive homes. The average American moves a lot. In a five-year period, 46% of Americans change their address. Renters move more than owners. Young people move more than older people. Thing one. Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address From the time of the first English colonies in America, Africans were brought to America as slaves. Most of them were taken to the South, where they worked on farms in the production of sugar, cotton, and other crops. White farmers in the South couldn't have been prosperous without slaves, but many Northerners were against slavery. One of those was Abraham Lincoln, the president who finally brought an end to slavery in the United States. Today, many people consider Abraham Lincoln to be one of the greatest presidents of the United States. But before he became president, many had doubts about his abilities. Lincoln's parents were poor and uneducated, and Lincoln had only 18 months of schooling. But he loved to read, and he educated himself. Because Lincoln had so little schooling, Journalists thought he must not have been very smart. Much to his opponent's surprise, Lincoln won the presidential election in 1860. At that time, Southern slave owners wanted to continue slavery, but Lincoln wanted to stop the spread of slavery. What followed was the worst internal crisis in American history, the Civil War. Over half a million soldiers died in the conflict, the most of any war that the United States fought in. On November 19, 1863, President Lincoln was invited to say a few words at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where a terrible battle had taken place. There must have been about 20,000 people there. Edward Everett, the main speaker, spoke first. His speech lasted two hours. Lincoln followed Everett with a two-minute speech. When he finished, everyone was silent. 
the audience may have been surprised by the brevity of the speech. Some people thought he must not have been finished. Seeing the reaction of the crowd, Lincoln turned to Everett and said he was afraid his speech had been a failure. He said he should have prepared it more carefully. Everett disagreed. He said the speech was perfect. He said the president had said more in two minutes than he, Everett, had said in two hours. This speech, known as the Gettysburg Address, is one of the greatest speeches in American history. Lincoln said that the country was dedicated to freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, had to continue. The Civil War continued until April 9, 1865, when the North finally won. Less than a week later, Lincoln was assassinated. Reading 2. The Cuban Missile Crisis It was October, and people around the world were terrified. It seemed almost certain that World War III was about to begin, and the planet was in danger of complete destruction. The whole planet? Was this a science fiction story? Unfortunately, no. The danger of worldwide destruction was possible, some thought even probable, October 27th is a day I'll never forget. The planet could have been destroyed, said a former CIA agent. He was referring to October 27th, 1962. It could have been the end of the world, but here we are. Forty years later, many of the surviving leaders in this terrifying crisis met to reflect back on the time when their actions could have resulted in the end of the world. Since the 1940s, the United States and the Soviet Union were enemies. The United States discovered that the Soviet Union was beginning to send nuclear missiles to Cuba, which is only about 90 miles from Florida. The American president, John Kennedy, saw this as a direct threat to national security. These weapons could have been used to destroy major cities and military bases in the United States. Spy photos showed that missiles in Cuba could have reached almost every part of the continental United States in a very short time. On October 22nd, President Kennedy announced on TV that any attack from Cuba would be considered an attack from the Soviet Union, and he would respond with a full attack on the Soviets. He sent out the U.S. Navy to block Soviet ships from delivering weapons to Cuba. An attack on a U.S. ship could have grown into a full nuclear war. This crisis could have changed the world as we know it. Fortunately, diplomacy won over war. The Soviets agreed to send their missiles back and promised to stop building military bases in Cuba. In exchange, the United States promised to remove its missiles from Turkey. What could have been a tragic event is now only a chapter in history. The Graying of America The overall population of the U.S. is growing slowly. In the year 2009, the American population was 303 million. By the middle of this century, it is going to be 404 million. Even though this is not a big growth, one group is growing very fast, the elderly. 65 years old and over. By 2030, 20% of the American population will be 65 or over. Today, there are 3 million people 85 or older. In 2050, 28 million will be 85 or older. There are two reasons for this sudden rise in the number of older Americans. First, life expectancy is increasing. In 1900, when the life expectancy was 47, one in 25 Americans was elderly. In 2000, with a life expectancy of 79.5 years for women and 74 for men, one in eight was elderly. By 2050, one in five will be elderly. The second reason for this growth is the aging of the baby boomers. In the 18 years after World War II, from 1946 to 1964, a large number of babies were born, 75 million. 
The people born during this period, known as the baby boomers, are now middle aged and will soon be elderly. The average age of the population is increasing as the baby boomers get older and live longer. The median age of Americans in 1970 was 28. In 2000, it was 35.3. By 2050, it will be 41.1. What does this mean for America? First, there will be a labor shortage as the baby boomers retire. There are fewer younger people to take their place at work. For taxpayers, The aging of Americans means that they are going to pay more taxes as one fifth of the population uses one half of the resources. Also, the country will see an increase in the number of nursing homes and the need for people to work in them. The housing market will have to respond to the needs of the baby boomers, too. As their children grow up and move out, many baby boomers will sell their bigger houses and move to smaller ones. Others will convert extra bedrooms to offices and home gyms. Also, we will see more and more retirement villages for active seniors. Some seniors will move from the suburbs to the city. We live in a suburb of Chicago now, says Paula Hoffman, 52. Because the schools for our teenage children are good, but when they go away to college, we are going to move back into the city. There's much more activity for us there. Susan Brecht, a housing consultant in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, says Baby boomers do not view retirement the way their parents and grandparents did. For starters, they're much more active. My 55 is not my mother's 55, Brecht stated. I think there is a change in how different generations respond to the aging process. And that's what we're seeing now and will see in a dramatic way for the next 10 to 20 years. It will be interesting to see how the baby boomers are going to continue to influence the future of America. Kids and Money Kids in the U.S. like to spend money. In 2009, the average 17 year old spent more than $100 a week. Much of today's advertising is directed at kids. When you go into a store, you often hear toddlers who are just learning to talk saying to their parents, Buy me a toy, buy me some candy. Some kids feel gratitude when they receive a dollar or a toy from a grandparent. But some kids feel a sense of entitlement. Even during the hard economic times of the early 1990s, sales of soft drinks, designer jeans, fast food, sneakers, gum, and dolls remained high. One factor in parents' generosity is guilt. As parents become busier in their jobs, they often feel guilty about not spending time with their kids. Often they deal with their guilt by giving their kids money and gifts. To help children understand the value of money, parents often give their children an allowance. The child's spending is limited to the money he or she receives each week. How much should parents give a child as an allowance? Some parents give the child a dollar for each year of his or her age. A five year old would get five dollars, a fifteen year old would get fifteen dollars. Some parents pay their kids extra for chores, such as taking out the garbage or shoveling snow. Other parents believe kids should do chores as part of their family responsibilities. When is the right time to start talking to kids about money? According to Nathan Dungan, a financial expert, the right time is as soon as kids can say, I want. By the time they start school, they must know there are limits. The High Cost of a College Education I decided not to go to college, Dad. What? Do you know how important a college education is? College is expensive. Besides, if I don't go to college now, I can start making money immediately. 
As soon as I earn some, I'd like to buy a car. Besides, my friends aren't going to college. I'm not concerned about them. I'm interested in you and your future. I was just reading an article in a magazine about how much more money a college graduate earns than a high school graduate. Here's the article. Look at it. It says, according to U.S. Census Bureau statistics, people with a bachelor's degree earn nearly twice as much as those with only a high school diploma. Over a lifetime, the gap in earning potential between a high school diploma and a B.A. or higher is more than $1 million. Wow. I never realized that I could earn much more with a college degree than without one. But look here. The article also says, In the 2008-2009 school year, the average tuition at a four-year private college was $25,143. And at a four-year public college, it was $6,585. How can you afford to send me to college? I didn't just start to think about your college education today. I started to think about it when you were born. We saved money each month to buy a house, and we bought one. And we saved some each month for your college tuition. That's great, Dad. I also want you to apply for financial aid. There are grants, loans, and scholarships you should also look into. Your grades are good. I think you should apply for a scholarship. I'll need to get an application. I already thought of that. I brought one home today. Let's fill it out together. Dad, if a college degree is so important to you, why didn't you get one? When I was your age, we didn't live in the U.S. We were very poor and had to help our parents. You have a lot of opportunities for grants and scholarships, but we didn't have any when I was young. Thanks for thinking about this from the day I was born. A Typical Thanksgiving Thanksgiving is a very special American holiday. We celebrate it on the fourth Thursday of November. People get together with family and friends. Airports are especially crowded as people travel to be with their families on this day. In fact, there are more travelers on the Sunday after Thanksgiving than any other day in the year. On Thanksgiving, people eat a very big meal. While waiting for the guests to arrive, the host family usually puts out snacks, such as potato chips and nuts. The main part of the meal is turkey. Most people stuff the turkey with a mixture of bread, onions, celery, nuts, and spices. Some people add fruit, such as apples or apricots, to the stuffing. Other parts of the meal include sweet potatoes, mashed potatoes, gravy, cornbread, and cranberry sauce. Then there is dessert. Pumpkin pie with whipped cream is a favorite dessert. The typical Thanksgiving meal contains more than 3,000 calories and is 45% fat. Many people talk about going on a diet the day after Thanksgiving. In addition to eating a big meal, many people relax and watch TV. It is a typical tradition to watch professional football on Thanksgiving Day. The men are especially interested in football. Many cities also have a parade on Thanksgiving morning. New York City has a very big parade. Millions of people go to see the parade. The Origin of Thanksgiving On Thanksgiving, Americans come together to give thanks for all the good things in their lives. Thanksgiving officially began in 1863 when President Lincoln declared that Americans would have a day of thanks. What is the origin of this great day? In 1620, a group of 120 men, women, and children left England for America on a ship called the Mayflower. They came to America in search of religious freedom. They started their new life in a deserted Indian village in what is now the state of Massachusetts. But half of the pilgrims did not survive their first cold, hard winter. In the spring, two American Indians found the people from England in very bad condition. They didn't have enough food, and they were in bad health. Squanto, an English-speaking American Indian, stayed with them for several months and taught them how to survive in this new land. He brought them deer meat and animal skins. 
He showed them how to grow corn and other vegetables. He showed them how to use plants as medicine. He explained how to use fish for fertilizer. He taught them many skills for survival in their new land. By the time their second fall arrived, the pilgrims had enough food to get through their second winter. They were in better health. They decided to have a Thanksgiving feast to celebrate their good fortune. They invited Squanto and neighboring Indian families of the Wampanoag tribe to come to their dinner. The pilgrims were surprised when 90 Indians showed up. The pilgrims did not have enough food for so many people. Fortunately, the Indian chief sent some of his people to bring food to the celebration. They brought five deer, fish, beans, squash, cornbread, berries, and many wild turkeys. The feast lasted for three days. There was a short time of peace and friendship between the Indians and the pilgrims. Now, on Thanksgiving, we eat some of the traditional foods from this period in American history. Reading One The Amazing Timothy Donner Timothy Donner looks like an average student in his t-shirt and jeans, but there is something very special about him. He speaks 20 languages. He doesn't speak all of them equally well, but he is very comfortable in many of them. He feels most comfortable with Hebrew, Farsi, French, and Arabic. At any one time, he is studying three to four languages. Videos of him are going around the Internet. In one video, he is riding in a taxi and talking to a Haitian taxi driver in French. In it, he is telling the driver that he wants to learn Creole, a language of Haiti. In another, he is speaking Russian with the owners of a video store in New York, where he lives. In another, he is speaking Farsi with the owner of a bookstore. He is asking the Farsi speaker for more information about that language. In other videos, he is studying Mandarin or discussing the similarities between Hebrew and Arabic with native speakers of these languages. He also speaks Urdu, Indonesian, Swahili, and Ojibwe, an American Indian language. Donner spends almost all his time trying to learn languages. To learn some languages, he takes classes. To learn others, he studies on his own. He always looks for opportunities to practice with native speakers. Sometimes he uses video chats to practice with native speakers in other countries. He uses other methods to improve his language ability. He memorizes the lyrics of songs or watches movies in other languages. He really enjoys himself. He thinks that language helps you connect to other people. When he speaks another language, he feels like a different person. Interestingly, he doesn't study Spanish. For him, Spanish isn't challenging enough. Reading 2 The Enduring Voices Project You probably know that there are endangered animals and plants. These are living things that are disappearing. Some animals, like dinosaurs, are already extinct, and many more living things are going to become extinct. But do you know that many languages are also disappearing? Every year, several languages go extinct. Today, there are more than 7,000 languages. By the year 2100, more than half of these languages will probably disappear. When the last speaker of a language dies, the world loses the knowledge contained in that language. Some languages have a lot of speakers. Mandarin, for example, now has 845 million speakers. English has 360 million first-language speakers. The Ojibwe language of Native Americans has about 5,000 speakers. Most of them are older than 65. Other languages have only one or two speakers. If nothing changes, these languages will die when the last speaker dies. The disappearance of languages is happening all over the world. Why do some languages disappear? Languages like English, Mandarin, Russian, Arabic, Hindi, and Spanish dominate world communication and business. In a part of Russia where the Tofa language exists, parents want their children to learn Russian because it will permit greater education and success. Right now, there are very few speakers of Tofa. 
How will this language survive? Is it going to be completely lost? In the project Enduring Voices, linguists visit areas around the world to record native speakers of endangered languages. They are helping many communities preserve their languages online. If you visit the Enduring Voices project online, you will be able to hear the sounds of these endangered languages. Even when the last speaker dies, these languages won't be lost. Why are linguists doing this project? Language tells us a lot about a culture. You probably have words in your native language that have no exact translation in English. These special words say something about your culture. When a language dies, an entire culture disappears with it. Seri is a language of Mexico. According to a Seri elder, if one child learns to speak Seri and another child learns to speak Spanish, they will be different people. Life after retirement. The U.S. population is aging. More and more Americans are thinking about retirement, but today. Many people are retiring younger and healthier than ever before. People are living longer, but they are not leaving their jobs to spend their days at the beach or to babysit for their grandchildren. Most older people prefer to keep busy. Many healthy seniors are starting new careers. They want to explore new avenues in their lives. Judy Perlman is a 62-year-old retired school teacher from Chicago. After 35 years in education, she is starting a new career, making dolls. Now I have time to do what I always dreamed about, she says. I'm having more fun than ever before. I'm meeting new people, traveling in my new job, and earning money all at the same time. And I'm still getting my teacher pension. I'm enjoying every minute of it. I think this is the best time of my life. After 33 years as an accountant, I'm now taking art classes," says Charles Haskell of Cleveland. "I'm discovering a new talent." Some senior citizens decide not to retire at all. Frank Babbitt of Milwaukee is a carpenter. He has his own business and works 50 hours a week, and he's almost 88 years old. Many older women are returning to work after raising their children. My kids are grown and don't need me now," says Miriam Orland of San Francisco. "So I have time for myself now. I'm taking courses at a community college. I'm thinking about a career in web design. Some retirees are using their free time to volunteer. I retired as an accountant six months ago." And now I volunteer as a math tutor in a public library near my house. I go to the library twice a week to help students who are having trouble with math," says Ron Myers of Miami. "I work in a food pantry and feed the homeless three times a week," says Linda Carlson of Washington D.C. "It gives me a lot of satisfaction." Today, healthy retirees are exploring many options. From relaxing to starting a new business or making a hobby into a new career, how do you see yourself as a retiree? Reading one. The mystery of risk. Have you ever wondered why some people take extreme risks? Have you ever thought about the dangers of exploring an unknown territory? All exploration involves taking big risks. Some explorers have endured hunger, others have faced animal attacks, or have survived extreme weather. Many explorers have experienced loneliness, and all have experienced uncertainty about the future. You have probably heard of Christopher Columbus. What pushed Columbus to sail across the Atlantic in 1492? And what motivated so many others throughout history to take similar risks? Some of the reasons behind risk taking are obvious: financial reward, fame, or saving lives. But as the danger increases, the number of people willing to take risks decreases. Only extreme risk takers remain. These are people willing to put their reputation, money, and even their lives in danger. This is the mystery of risk. 
what makes some people willing to go on when they could lose so much? In recent years, scientists have begun to study the connection between chemicals in the brain and risk-taking. They have found that the chemical dopamine pushes us to try new things, such as climbing a mountain, starting a company, running for political office, or exploring an unknown territory. Paul Nicklin, an Arctic explorer, has been a photojournalist since 1995. He specializes in photographing polar regions with the goal of teaching people about the wildlife there. In his explorations, he has come close to dangerous animals, such as 3,000-pound walruses in near-freezing water, and has taken amazing photographs. Nicklin has taken extreme risks to show the world the dangers that animals in these regions face. He has given us an extraordinary look at the polar landscape and wildlife and has received many awards for his outstanding photography. Scientists believe that our willingness to take risks to explore our planet has always been part of the human experience. Reading 2 Exploring the Ocean When she first explored the ocean, Sylvia Earle thought the sea was too large to suffer harm from people. But in just a few decades, many marine animal species have disappeared or become scarce. Sylvia Earle is an oceanographer, explorer, author, and lecturer. She has taken many risks to explore the ocean. If you put all the time she has spent underwater together, it adds up to more than 7,000 hours or nearly a year of her life. So far, she has led over 100 expeditions. In the 1960s, she had to fight to join expeditions. Women weren't welcome. Today, she fights to protect marine life. What has happened to the ocean in recent years? Unfortunately, many harmful things have happened. For millions of years, sharks, tuna, turtles, whales, and many other large sea animals lived in the Gulf of Mexico without a problem. But by the end of the 20th century, many of these animals were starting to disappear because of overfishing. Drilling for oil and gas on the ocean floor has also harmed many sea animals. Earl has won many awards for her work. She has received 26 honorary degrees from universities and has been on hundreds of radio and television shows. In her effort to protect the ocean, she has lectured in more than 90 countries and has written more than 200 publications. She has even written several children's books. In 1998, Time magazine named Earl its first hero for the planet. Earl said... As a child, I did not know that people could protect something as big as the ocean or that they could cause harm. But now we know. The ocean is in trouble, and therefore, so are we. She added, We still have a really good chance to make things better than they are. They won't get better unless we take the action and inspire others to do the same thing. No one is without power. Everybody has the capacity to do something. Americans and their pets. Most Americans love pets. About 63% of Americans live with one or more animals. About 39% of households have at least one dog. 34% of households own at least one cat. Americans think of their pets as part of the family. Americans spend approximately $5 billion a year on holiday presents for their pets. Almost half of all pet owners talk to their pets on occasion. Many pet owners sleep with their dogs or cats. Many people travel with their pets. It costs between $25 and $150 to fly with a pet. Some hotels allow guests to bring their pets. Americans pay a lot of money to keep pets. They spend about $43.2 billion a year in vet bills. There are schools, toys, hotels, restaurants, clothes, perfumes, and cemeteries for pets. There are magazines for pet owners. There are hundreds of websites for pet owners. Pets are a lot of fun. 
they are affectionate, too. People who are lonely get a lot of love from their animals. Medical research shows that contact with a dog or a cat can lower a person's blood pressure. Pets need a lot of attention. Before you buy a pet, it is important to answer these questions. Are you patient? Are you home a lot? If you have children, are they responsible? Are pets allowed where you live? Do you have money for medical bills for your pet? Unfortunately, some people don't realize that pets need a lot of care. Some people see a cute puppy or kitten, buy it, and later abandon it because they don't want to take care of it. It is important to understand that a pet is a long-term responsibility. Guide Dogs Most dogs have an easy life in the U.S. They eat, play, get attention from their owners, and sleep. But some dogs work hard. They are called guide dogs. Guide dogs help blind people move from place to place safely. Guide dogs and their owners are a team. Guide dogs don't lead the owners, and their owners don't completely control the guide dogs. They work together. The guide dogs don't know where the owners want to go, so they follow the owner's instructions. The owners can't see the obstacles along the way, so the dogs make decisions for the safety of the owners. Guide dogs stop at all curbs and intersections before crossing a street. They don't see color, so they don't know if the light is red or green. The owners decide if it is time to cross the street by listening to the sound of traffic. The dogs help the owners get on a bus or train. They learn to obey many verbal commands. Most guide dogs are golden retrievers, Labrador retrievers, or German shepherds. These three breeds are very intelligent, obedient, and friendly. A guide dog needs to work without distraction in noisy places, bad weather, crowds of people, and difficult situations. When you see a guide dog, it is important that you recognize that the dog needs to concentrate on its job. Don't pet or talk to the dog. Guiding is very complicated, and it requires a dog's full attention. Guide dog training lasts about five months. Only about 72% of dogs that enter the training program graduate. Those that graduate bring their owners valuable help and love. In other dog training programs, trainers use food as a reward. In guide dog training, the trainer does not use food. He or she uses physical and verbal affection. This is because a guide dog sometimes takes the owner to a restaurant. It must lie patiently at the owner's feet without wanting to eat. Guide dogs like to play, too, but only after the work is finished. How do dogs know when their work is finished? When the harness is on, they know they have to work. When it is off, they can play. Like all dogs, they love to play. Golf and Tiger Woods Golf is the only sport where the player with the lowest score wins. The player who puts the ball in the hole with the fewest tries, strokes, is the winner. Golf originally comes from Scotland, where you can still find the earliest golf course. Until the beginning of the 20th century, golf was mainly popular in Scotland and England. Golf is not the most popular sport in the U.S., but in recent years, the U.S. has produced the greatest quantity of leading professional golfers. One of the most remarkable players is Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods was born in 1975 in California. Before he could walk or talk, he loved to watch his father play golf. At age two, he began to play golf with his father and soon became a better golfer than his father. When Woods was in high school in California, he became the youngest person in the U.S. to win the Junior Amateur Championship. At age 19, he became the youngest winner of the U.S. Amateur Championship.
In 1996, at the age of 21, he became a professional golfer. Today, Woods is one of the most successful golfers of all time. He is the only person to be named Sports Illustrated Sportsman of the Year more than once, in 1996 and 2000. In 2007, he was the highest paid professional athlete, earning approximately $122 million from winnings and endorsements. Woods' father died in 2006. Woods wrote on his website at the time, My dad was my best friend and greatest role model, and I will miss him. American's Attitude Toward Soccer Soccer is by far the most popular sport in the world. Almost every country has a professional league. In many countries, top international soccer players are as well-known as rock stars or actors. However, in 1994, when the World Cup soccer competition was held in the U.S., there was not a lot of interest in soccer among Americans. Many people said that soccer was boring. Recently, Americans' attitude toward soccer has been changing. In 1999, when the Women's World Cup was played in the U.S., there was more interest than ever before. Little by little, soccer is becoming more popular in the U.S. The number of children playing soccer is growing. In fact, soccer is growing faster than any other sport. For elementary school children, soccer is now the number two sport after basketball. More kids play soccer than baseball. Many coaches believe that soccer is easier to play than baseball or basketball and that there aren't as many injuries as with sports such as hockey or football. Interest in professional soccer in the U.S. is still much lower than in other countries. The number of Americans who watch professional basketball, football, or hockey is still much higher than the number who watch Major League Soccer. However, the more parents show interest in their children's soccer teams, the more they will become interested in professional soccer. Equal Rights for All Today, all people in the United States have equal rights under the law. But this was not always the case, especially for African Americans. Even though slavery in the U.S. ended in 1865, blacks continued to suffer discrimination and segregation, especially in the South. Many hotels, schools, and restaurants were for whites only. Many businesses there used to have signs in their windows that said, Blacks not allowed. Black children used to go to separate and often inferior schools. Many professions were for whites only. Even in sports, blacks could not join the major leagues. There used to be separate leagues for blacks. In many places in the South, buses used to reserve the front seats for white people. One evening in December of 1955, a 42-year-old woman, Rosa Parks, got on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, to go home from work. She was tired when she sat down. When some white people got on the crowded bus, the bus driver ordered Ms. Parks to stand up. Ms. Parks refused to leave her seat. The bus driver called the police, and they came and arrested Ms. Parks. Martin Luther King Jr., a black minister living in Montgomery, Alabama, wanted to put an end to discrimination. When King heard about Ms. Parks' arrest, he told African Americans in Montgomery to boycott the bus company. People who used to ride the bus to work decided to walk instead. As a result of the boycott, the Supreme Court outlawed discrimination on public transportation. In 1964, about 100 years after the end of slavery, Congress passed a new law that officially gave equality to all Americans. This law made discrimination in employment and education illegal. King won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in creating a better world. In 1968, a great tragedy occurred. Someone shot and killed King when he was only 39 years old. In 1983, Martin Luther King's birthday, January 15th, became a national holiday.
Barack Obama, and Dreams from My Father. On January 20th, 2009, Barack Obama became the first African American president. He was born in Hawaii in 1961, the son of a Kenyan father and an American mother. But Barack didn't know his father as he was growing up. When he was two years old, his parents separated and his father went back to Africa. Obama saw his father one more time in his life, when his father visited Hawaii. His father died in a car accident in 1982, when Barack was 21 years old. In 1995, he wrote about his life in Dreams from My Father. He realized that he didn't belong completely to a white world, and he didn't belong completely to a black world. When he was young, he didn't have a clear racial identity. His mother married again, this time to an Indonesian man, and for a while, Barack lived with her in Indonesia. But he returned to Hawaii when he was 10 to live with his grandparents. His mother returned too, but she didn't stay for long. She went back to Indonesia, where she stayed for the rest of her life. For many years, he didn't live with his mother. She died in 1995. Barack Obama adored his grandmother, but sadly, she didn't live to see him become president. She died one day before the election. Finding Old Friends Americans move numerous times during their lives. As a result, they often lose touch with old friends. Usually, during their 20s and 30s, people are too busy building their careers and starting their families to think much about the past. But as people get older, they often start to wonder about the best friend they had in high school, the soldier with whom they served in the military, the person who lived next door when they were growing up, or their high school sweetheart. Many people want to connect with the past. Before the Internet... Finding a lost love or an old friend required searching through old phone books and libraries in different cities, hard work, and a lot of luck. It was especially hard to find married women who changed their names. Now with the internet, old friends can sometimes find each other in seconds. Several websites have emerged to meet people's growing desire to make connections with former classmates. There are websites that list the students in high schools and colleges in the U.S., People who went to high school in the U.S. can list themselves according to the school they attended and the year they graduated. A man might go to these websites looking for the guys he played football with or a long-lost friend and find the name of a first love whom he hasn't seen in years. One website, classmates.com, claims that more than 40 million Americans have listed themselves on their site. Married women who have changed their names list themselves by their maiden names so that others can recognize them easily. Another way that people make connections with old classmates is through reunions. Some high school graduating classes meet every 10 years. They usually have dinner, remember the time when they were young, and exchange information about what they are doing today. They sometimes bring their high school yearbooks, which have pictures of the graduates and other school memories. Some classes have their reunions in the schools where they first met. Others have their reunions in a nice restaurant. There are websites that specialize in helping people find their former classmates and plan reunions. In America's highly mobile society, it takes some effort to connect with old friends. Looking back at fond memories, renewing old friendships, making new friends, and even starting a new romance with an old love can be the reward for a little work on the Internet. Social Networking in the 21st Century The method of social networking has changed in the 21st century, thanks to the Internet. Mark Zuckerman, the creator of one popular site, Facebook, started his network in 2004 when he was a student at Harvard University. He realized that students, whose lives are very busy, wanted to be able to find out about their friends' thoughts and activities. By 2007, Facebook had 70 million users. Other social networking sites, like Friendster and MySpace, also became popular all over the world. 
When asked, why did you join this site? Here is how some people responded. I'm interested in politics, and it's a good way to find people whose interests are the same as mine. I can share photos with my friends and make comments on their photos. I can see what friends we have in common. I can hear about events from my friends. I can share my favorite links with my friends. Who are the members of these social networking sites? At first, they were mostly teenagers and college students. Soon, parents whose kids were hooked on social networking started joining too. Another way to bring together people whose interests are the same is through a website called meetup.com. Unlike online social networking, whose members learn about each other's activities on a website, Meetup members get notices about events online but actually get together in coffee houses, restaurants, parks, etc. A big city like New York has over 4,000 meetup groups per week, ranging from chess players to book lovers, bicyclists, and French speakers. The internet brings people together in creative ways. Obesity a national problem. Everyone knows that it's important to eat well and get enough exercise. We see beautiful, thin fashion models and want to look like them. We see commercials for exercise machines on TV showing fit, thin, smiling people exercising. Health clubs are full of people trying to get in shape. Sales of diet colas and low-calorie and low-carbohydrate foods indicate that Americans want to be thin. However, two-thirds of American adults are overweight, and one in six American children is overweight. This is a large increase from 30 years ago, when 50% of adults and only about 5% of children were overweight. Approximately half of Americans are concerned about their weight. They spend billions of dollars on weight loss products and health clubs. But weight is also becoming a national problem as health costs go up in response to diseases related to obesity, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, arthritis, and stroke. What is the reason for this growing problem? First, today's lifestyle does not include enough physical activity. When the U.S. was an agricultural society, Farmers ate a big, heavy meal, but they burned off the calories by doing hard physical labor. Modern technology has removed physical activity from our daily lives. 75% of all trips are less than a mile from home, but Americans drive. Only 15% of schoolchildren walk to school, even though most of them live within one mile of school and the average American child spends approximately 24 hours a week watching TV. In most physical education classes, kids are active for just three minutes. Another reason for the weight problem is the American diet. The average child sees more than 10,000 food commercials a year. Most of these are for high-calorie foods, such as sweetened cereals, sugary soft drinks, salty chips, and other snack foods. We call these unhealthy foods junk food. Children and adults often prefer junk food. Adults have busy lives and depend on fast food. The supermarkets are filled with cheap, tasty food that is easy to prepare and high in calories. Obesity is quickly becoming the number one cause of preventable death. Sleep Most people need eight hours of sleep but don't get enough. Most Americans get less than seven hours a night. Only 30% get enough sleep. When people aren't rested enough, there are bad results. For example, if people drive when they're too tired, they can cause serious accidents on the road. According to the National Transportation Administration, sleepy drivers cause 100,000 accidents each year. There are many work-related accidents, too. But that's not all. If you stay awake too long, your mind and nervous system begin to malfunction.
In the long term, if you don't get enough sleep, you will have less resistance to infection and disease. Are we too busy to get enough sleep? Not always. Besides job and family responsibilities, Americans have a lot of other things that keep them out of bed. 24-hour-a-day internet and TV keep us awake. Supermarkets, shopping malls, and laundromats are open late. A lot of Americans, approximately 75%, report having trouble sleeping a few nights per week. Maybe they have too much stress in their lives or don't have good sleep habits. Sleep experts have some recommendations. Don't nap during the day. Don't get too stimulated before going to bed. Avoid activities such as watching TV or eating before bed. Go to bed at the same time every night. Avoid caffeine after lunchtime. If you drink too much coffee during the day, don't expect to get a good night's sleep. Exercise. Physical activity is very good for sleep. But if you exercise too late in the day, it will interfere with your sleep. A good night's sleep is very important, so turn off the TV, shut down the computer, and sleep well. Jury Duty All Americans are protected by the Constitution. No one person can decide if a person is guilty of a crime. Every citizen has the right to a trial by jury. When a person is charged with a crime, he is considered innocent until the jury decides he is guilty. Most American citizens are chosen for jury duty at some time in their lives. How are jurors chosen? The court gets the names of citizens from lists of taxpayers, licensed drivers, and voters. Many people are called to the courthouse for the selection of a jury. From this large number, 12 people are chosen. The lawyers and the judge ask each person questions to see if the person is going to be fair. If the person has made any judgment about the case before hearing the facts presented in the trial, he is not selected. If the juror doesn't understand enough English, he is not selected. The court needs jurors who can understand the facts and be open-minded. When the final jury selection is made, the jurors must raise their right hands and promise to be fair in deciding the case. Sometimes a trial goes on for several days or more. Jurors are not permitted to talk with family members and friends about the case. In some cases, jurors are not permitted to go home until the case is over. They stay in a hotel and are not permitted to watch TV or read newspapers that give information about the case. After the jurors hear the case, they have to make a decision. They go to a separate room and talk about what they heard and saw in the courtroom. When they are finished discussing the case, they take a vote. Jurors are paid for their work. They receive a small amount of money per day. Employers must give a worker permission to be on a jury. Being on a jury is considered a very serious job. Unusual Lawsuits When a person is injured or harmed, it is the court's job to determine who is at fault. Most of these cases never make the news, but a few of them appear in the newspapers and on the evening news because they are so unusual. In 1992, a fast food restaurant was sued by a 79-year-old woman in New Mexico who spilled hot coffee on herself while driving. She suffered third-degree burns on her body. At first, the woman asked for $11,000 to cover her medical expenses. When the restaurant refused, the case went to court, and the woman was awarded nearly $3 million. In 2002, a group of teenagers sued several fast food chains for serving food that made them fat. The case was thrown out of court. According to Congressman Rick Keller, Americans have to get away from this new culture where people always try to play the victim and blame others for their problems. 
Mr. Keller, who is overweight and eats at fast food chains once every two weeks, said that suing the food industry is not going to make a single individual any skinnier. It will only make the trial attorney's bank accounts fatter. In June 2004, an Indiana woman sued a cell phone company for causing an auto accident in which she was involved. The court decided that the manufacturer of a cell phone cannot be held responsible for an auto accident involving a driver using its product. In March 2000, a teenage girl in Virginia was struck and killed by a driver conducting business on a cell phone. The girl's family sued the driver's employer for $30 million for wrongful death. They said that it was the company's fault because employees are expected to conduct business while driving. The family lost its case. We are protected by the law, but as individuals, we need to take personal responsibility and not blame others for our mistakes. The court system is designed to protect us. It is up to us to make sure that trials remain serious.